Hello and welcome for this new session of learning from the masters. In this one, part two of this Vermeer master copy. Last uh, two weeks ago, actually not last week, uh, we started with the underpainting for this, um, and we we just talked about the the process a little bit. We learned what we could. And we, I had to stop there because it was just a little bit too, too intense to do everything in just one go. So uh, right now we're going to have uh, all the time we need to focus on color mixing, making the, the transition, or the rendering of the painting and finishing this master copy. Just as a, a sort of a uh, a quick word, a full word on master copying. Just in the way I see it, it's not about like uh, technical and historical accuracy. I'm not pretending that whatever technique I'm going to be using for this one is is accurately describing what Vermeer used. I'm just finding inspiration in how Vermeer used to paint and how he painted this. Actually, this is just the cropped version. Uh, the, the painting is actually a bit bigger. So it's just to, just to get some inspiration from an artist that you love and admire. I think this is the best, the best approach to master copy. You can go the, the more historical way, try to find the actual old recipes that they used, try to make everything like the old masters. This is not my, my thing though, it's sti still very interesting but it's not what I do. I'm mostly copying for my own benefits, it's like very selfish <laughs> in a way. It's uh, just just to have fun, just to practice, to train and to see painting through the vision of someone else. So what I'm mostly interested in, in is the artistic sense, the sense of artistry, not, not the, the, the method, the process in itself. So that's how I do it. But feel free to approach this however you prefer. Anyway, I hope you're doing wonderfully today and let's just have a quick and a nice uh, streaming session with everyone. So um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, hi Florent, look forward to part two. Enjoyed last week's live. Yeah, I enjoyed it as well. So looking forward to starting again. Uh, been attempting oil painting today, prefer this medium to a critic. Uh, Andreas, good evening. Felicia, howdy. Eric, Virginia. Uh, Imo, hello from Norway. So, hello everyone. All right, so actually, let's not start here and let's start on the palette because we have uh, some some mixing to do. So let me pull this. Oh. Sorry, some wire, some wire problems here. Okay. Okay. Aha. Got it. Um, I think I'm gonna, well, okay, I'm gonna try like this. It's kind of, I might be blocking the way. I'm just going to remove the autofocus. Um, good evening from India. Good evening from France. It's pretty late in India, isn't it? It's kind of the, isn't the middle of the night, depending on where you are. Well, I hope you're doing well. All right, so I'm gonna try uh, mixing the skin tones and I'm gonna try to not completely block 
the view just so that you can see because it's basically going to be our main focus today so last time we spent some time working on the kind of the underpainting and right for this episode we are more going to um, focus on everything concerning colors and start painting the first layer know that Technically, Vermeer used to paint with several layers. I'm not necessarily going to do the same. As I said, I'm not sticking to the, the process exactly, but I'm doing my best to make this an entertaining and, and a sort of a, a nice session that's full of both well entertainment and and good painting vibes that you can learn from that's the spirit it's not to be like it's not like a tutorial session where i do like f three hours straight of teaching you guys how to paint it's more like i'm painting and you're hanging out and we all have fun Hey Jasmine! Hi Andrew from Malta! Hi Barbara! Barbara says bonjour. Actually it's more bonsoir here because it's kind of the evening but depends. If you're in Quebec actually you can say bonjour or in French uh, speaking parts of Louisiana I guess. Or in Guyane. Where else? In Guadeloupe, also. Some parts of the world are still considered day. So you can still say bonjour in French. Bonjour. So the the skin color the, the 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 color is pretty pale, but you never want to to push it too far, right? So the the paleness like is very often for old portraits. You know, it was fashionable at some point to be very very like the contrary to what is is fashionable today which is to be very tan um, there was a, a time in the era where the paler the, the better you just don't want to push the the white too much but you you want to gradually so you, you start with you can still start with something that's a little bit too much on the white side basically almost like if you look at this it's almost pure like almost pure white it's not it's not pure white but it's not far from it and you can just the good thing with white is that it, it's the color that's the easiest to pollute so you don't need much to to move away from it so that's the good thing about about that color you can start with something just a little bit too too much and just with a touch of i don't know like you can paint this let's say and with just a touch of yellow and you, you you just blend it in and you get something approaching but just a bit uh, less less light so but generally yeah you, you don't want to push it too much like um sometimes when you just started the portrait and you don't have any type of color reference to to refer to um, you have the tendency to make colors either too light or too dark you know when you don't have a, a sort of a landmark color that you can attach your other colors to that you can key to like you can't tune like imagine that it's a guitar and you don't have the 
you don't know what's A or what's C, and you can't tune the rest of the of the strings basically. And it's kind of the same thing if you when you just start you can get lost it's usually why i and we suggest to start with the darkest cutter because this way it gives you a point of reference from which you can then derive all the other cutters i don't know if it makes sense i'm, I'm gonna try to make it make sense later when i'm actually painting Hello from Greece. Hello, uh, Andreas from Giverny. Hello, Andreas. Uh, do you have CAD orange on your palette? Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. My bad. It's like I'm so rude. I'm using colors. I'm not even writing it. I'm not even writing what they are on the screen, and I'm not even like introducing my colors to you guys. Sorry. This is um, titanium white. Uh, but you can use flake white, of course, if you want to be more inspired by a Rembrandt, uh, sorry, by Vermeer. This is yellow ochre. This is pure red, but you can use vermilion, any type of vermilion substitute. I don't recommend the original vermilion because it's, it's toxic, it's nasty, and we have colors that perform better. So cadmium, cadmium red would work as well. Um, this is um, this is Mada Lake. Well, you can call it Mada Lake, or you can call it Elizarin. It's more or less the same. It's a non-fugitive substitute. So it's uh, which one? Oh, this one is actually PV19. This is by Le the Le Franc Bourgeois one. And they use PV19, so you, the the same hues can pretty much be recreated from anything that looks like what we call alizarin, mad lake, red matter. Like it's all kind of the same family of hues, and it can be. There are a lot of alternatives today. Uh, this is this was supposed to be uh, red ochre, but um, I don't have any red ochre, so I recreated this out of transparent iron oxide and venetian red and this is, this is my own my own house blend basically my own uh, burnt umber ultramarine and um, mars black yeah mars black so that's that's it Uh, I tried a lovely warm white by Michael Harding. Use that sparingly as it's expensive. Yeah, I also have the Michael Harding uh, white. All the, like, all the white that I use is, is the Michael Harding brand because they use the, um, the, the titanium white that's ground in linseed oil. And uh, it's, it's kind of good to have a, a titanium white ground in linseed oil when it's done well not not any linseed oil kind of titanium white will work but so it makes the drying more effective and the, the cutter is also great so and they have a warm white so yeah they sell the the warmer whites I don't have anything to say against them. It's just that technically any warmish white can be recreated by just adding warm pigments. But I get the point. It's just whenever you're mixing and you're adding white, it creates less of a, of a hue, a, a contrast in hue because white has a tendency to pull more towards the cool side. So by using a warm white, you 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 sort of compensate for this effect and you have less of these issues and yeah this is also white uh this is also why sorry also why um flake white is generally preferred for those who have the um, the chance to have some where they are 
as I said, I, I guess I'm still going to repeat that. Um, I don't have a an easy way to find flake white where I live because it's just um, uh, if you don't know, flake white is made out of lead oxide, and lead oxide is well, it's kind of poisonous if you use it in the bad conditions. Well, lots of things are kind of toxic under the the wrong conditions, but. This one is kind of, yeah, it has caused problems and right now we have titanium dioxide, so titanium white to use instead. So yeah, they, they can ban lead white, we, we have replacements. So for me, I could like, like it would be a, a nightmare, but I could find a way to get to get my hand on some lead white I think I know legally speaking but I I'm pretty sure that I could find a way to get some but it's just not worth the the trouble for me I think I, I've learned how to use titanium white and mix it well so that I can compensate for all of its, let's say, issues, basically. So titanium white is not not enough of this, not enough of that, but well, with time, you learn how to circumvent this and just use it for what it is. It's still a great pigment. And uh, it still works great. Um, I'm gonna. I lost track of chat, but I'm gonna come back to you later when I'm done with this. Just gonna prepare a couple of, um, couple of mixes again. So some black. Let's go for this. And a very dark brown of some sort. And yeah, the dress is pretty much yellow and all. So I don't know about, I'm gonna use my reproduction and my reproduction is kind of old. So the color is more yellow than the original. But for the sake of my own like sanity, I'm going to to concentrate on the colors as I see them on my reproduction. You, you are going to see what I mean. You'll see what I mean. Because like trying to mentally color correct um, a painting based on a model that, that's not reliable, it's a nightmare, so I'm not going to do that. All right, so let's get back to our business here. Okay. Okay, so it's a good sign the autofocus has noticed that this is supposed to be a face. So that's a small win for me. <laughs> the, my camera has, has uh, detected that this is a human being that I've painted. Good. All right. <laughs> kind of insulting for Vermeer because they didn't select this one <laughs> as sort of the autofocus one. Okay, uh, let let me just um, let me just try to catch back where where did I left you guys in chat? So hello from Greece that I saw. Um, so Andreas lives in Giverny, which is awesome, where Monet has had it had its uh, place basically. Okay, um, um, Damian, hello from Poland. Hello Poland. 
I love you, worm. Okay. Hello, Elio. Do you use radiant white? I feel as if the body and tone is closer to flake white. What do you think? Never tried, so I have no opinion. I don't know. What brand are you? Do you recommend? What about the yellowing of whites along time by time, with time? Yeah, every cutter yellows with time and there's no cure for that. This is called aging. Everything is going to age, basically. And, and yeah, that's the... Um, that's the key like most of the time it's it's due to the oils the oils and the resins are what yellow the most and all the colors kind of yellow as well some have a sort of a a color a sort of a how do you say it? they fade fade away basically like um, some of the organic cutters, like a lot of the uh, traditional matter, the lakes, stuff like that, they have a tendency to fade. And the other cutters, what they do is they yellow. So when it happens on a yellow, it's not a huge problem. When it happens on a cutter that's, that's dark and all, it's not a problem, you don't notice. But this black is going to yellow over time, like in 500 years, this black will be much more yellow than it is today. But you won't be noticing it because it's it's just too dark. And the other colors, they, you, you will notice them. And for the white, obviously you notice. The good thing is all the colors yellow almost at the same time. It's just some colors you do notice it and some you don't and just someone will maybe one day pick up your paint and restore it but you have some you obviously have some colors that yellow less and the good quality good quality oil the oil that has been well purified the medium the, the paint that has been like high quality paint from your trusted manufacturer will yellow less. There's also a problem with white is that if you if you cut it completely from sunlight, well, you shouldn't expose it directly to sunlight, but if you put it in a completely dark place, it will also uh, yellow prematurely very prematurely and excessively which is just an effect of being completely deprived of sunlight so it needs light but not direct so put it in a place where you will not necessarily yeah not necessarily sunlight but it needs light a lot of light but not like straight up sunlight directly it's a weird effect and I don't know exactly what causes it. So don't put the, the your painting like in a completely closed um, closet, basically. I have Gamblin for most mixing but also Rembrandt. I use a safflower oil medium body and it's less opaque than, than titanium white with the linseed oil body, plus a bit warmer. Yeah, you every time you, you look for something you'll find like the best type of combination. I guess it all depends on what everyone what everybody prefers. For me the the white is also 
Uh, my choice of white is also a lot due to the body and the consistency. And actually, I, I've showed you a white that I use, but it's just one of them. And I, I switch my whites. Basically, I have a white that I'm going to use for the underpainting, which, can, uh, which uh, has a lot of linseed oil. And there's also a white that I'm going to use more for the overpainting and another white that I'm going to use more for the impasse. So I also have a white that I'm going to use especially for the underpainting, a very fast drying white with a secative. So yeah, it's, um, I agree that white is a tricky pigment. It's like a science of its own, basically. Um, yeah, there's no no secret. It's just about trying them out and seeing what works. Okay, so let's start painting. So right now, I don't have anything uh, else to do here. To start, I can start, it's like my job is already done because I need to start with the darkest color and so my darkest would be here, here and here under the nose but I already have them so I can start gradually going out so I'm gonna take this color and compare it to the one next to it and gradually I'll expand the range of, uh, of colors right now i'm just going because we were talking about the whites i'm going to start with this area just to check if my mixing was correct or not and i'm going to slowly apply it like that so i see my, that my mix is more pink than it's supposed to be but again this as we were talking about yellowing but look at this the reproduction itself has yellowed so it it was a cutter like it was a a, a cutter reproduction from a magazine actually but was like it's a magazine from like a long time ago i guess but it was completely protected from from everything it was like tightly inside the pages of the magazine but it still had yellow a lot actually so everything yellows that's just our fate I don't try to fight it too much I guess like in my in my paintings I have tried to let go of this like it's like having white hair you know <laughs> like having gray and white hair is a sign of like like becoming more, becoming like I, I okay okay I do have white hair, <laughs> but so I I I'm not gonna dye my hair or try to do something about it. I'm going to be happy with it. See, can you see my all my white hair? Look at this. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of like that for painting, like yellowing is the white hair of painting. And then you have crackings as well, which is like the wrinkles of a painting. It's the same thing. It's, it's unpreventable in a way. It will happen. It's just how much of, how damaging will it be? That's the only thing. You don't want it to damage like crucial parts of the painting. So you want to have sound techniques, sound layering methods and follow the fat over the inner rule. And then we'll see, just see how it goes. Just, but it will age. That's the one thing that's impossible to prevent. Yeah, obviously linseed oil is the real cause of yellowing. 
you can use something you can use something else or you can also use something like like stand oil which yellows less but still yellows or you can use something that doesn't really dry very well and then you have some other some other problems but everything yellows like have you ever looked at a have you ever looked do you have like a you know a white microwave in your kitchen a white fridge uh, like you know an old white fridge with uh, plastic bits is there some linseed oil in there no it's a plastic it's a polymer but it's still yellows still yellows like you leave the thing out there and it will yellow just take some just garden furniture like you know the the plastic chairs for your garden they're pure white come back 10 years later they're yellow or and gray and green because of the, the dust and, and the you know the greenery is outside but you know what I mean and everything like the old titanium white um, flake white all the all the whites all the pigments all the colors everything turns to something else at some point which is why if you want to keep your colors absolutely intact you want to use like the basically what the caveman used and so restrict your pigments to the ochres and also the you know burnt carbon and that's a hundred percent safe so basically a Zorn palette but with you know just ochres instead of a, a, a vermilion so a red ochre or a, an iron oxide red uh, a yellow like yellow ochre like an actual iron oxide yellow or an ochre yellow and this will this will, will stick and this will this will almost um, not move like for like you have a couple of millennia before it will actually start moving in terms of color have you ever seen a Vermeer in person at the museum they are rich in color yeah they are amazingly well preserved indeed and it's a shame because I don't have like most of what makes this uh, this painting for example I don't have like you have other colors outside and nuances so right here is like almost like only shades of yellow and green which makes it a little bit boring in terms of color compared to the original but I don't just don't have a better reproduction want to go to the Vermeer exhibition in Amsterdam but all the tickets were sold out it's a shame all these big shows they are really something though uh, it's not really my thing though because I'm I'm the type of person who would go to a museum and just stare at the same painting for like a couple hours and just get out then just because I, I like to be to be stuck in the painting and just get in in the in the universe of the painting and stay there for as much as I can 
and I, I don't necessarily like to sort of, you know, tour the entire collection and see everything I need to see. I want to really see. So generally I, <laughs> I tend to go to only museums that have like a free pass or something like that. to zoom <laughs> okay now with the zoom you you'll see a little bit more clearly what I do. I like this, uh, this is a new lens that allows me to really make some pretty, um, pretty insane close-ups, but I, I really like it when you see close-up like that. You really understand how it how it feels to paint, I guess. Because when you're focused on, on somewhere, you don't, you don't have all the side vision and the peripheral vision. You're really focused on something and getting like with a strong close-up like that really pulls you in and sort of helps you as a viewer to become more involved Especially for when I'm painting stuff that's so so refined like this.
it's funny how when you're painting a Vermeer, you're always inspired to have such a, a soft, silky touch, almost like just caressing the 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 canvas with just small amount of paint and just gradually but very softly almost not touching it basically i mean at least it's that's how it feels to me that's how i feel like this should go i don't know maybe he had like something very different when he originally painted this but Actually, that's just how I feel like painting, like naturally, you sort of tend to to understand the paint a certain way when you're basically feeling the artist's, the original artist's shoes. And this obsession on softness. And being very delicate It's almost like little dots, almost like pointism here.
so let's go for the the blushy cheeks Jasmine, one thing to push me to paint portrait <clears throat> is that I absolutely love skin tones and all the shades we can obtain in painting. Absolutely. <coughs> Sorry. And it's what's especially fascinating is how like from the same like couple of pigments you can obtain almost all the skin tones to paint like almost anybody on else like on earth sorry like all types of human beings it's like there's no no such thing as a palette for asian people palette for middle eastern people or anything it's like every human can have can be painted with the same couple pigments like very simple 
very humble pigments as well. You don't need something like, like super sophisticated. And yet there is so much refinement, so much subtlety that, uh, yeah, uh, it's a fascinating subject. I agree with Jasmine. And when you start uh, thinking about cutted lights, that what they didn't have in the time of Vermeer, like you know, right now you have like skin colors, like from actual human beings, but you know, with neon lights, with like a, a lot of new colors that we are, that we have today, thanks to our technology that Vermeer didn't have, like what they had before was just candle light. And yet only with candlelight, you can bring so much more variety than just like skin under normal, like, you know, sunlight conditions, basically. And yeah, there is so much interaction between the light source, the model. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating and you can definitely and many artists have done just that. You can spend an entire, like a lifetime, just trying to work on, on that. And still, at the end of this entire lifetime, entire career spent, um, focusing on, on skin tones, on the subtleties of the human figure, the human face, you wouldn't even have scratched the surface <coughs> in terms of variety. So that's quite, quite amazing. Love the research for mixing tones and harmonize the tones. Yep, I agree. Like definitely what we have over music, like, you know, in music, you have to tune your instrument and you have a certain amount of notes, like between, between A and like, between uh, A and B, you have a certain number of, you know, you have a certain just, I don't know how you call this in English, like, well, anyhow, you know. So basically you have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and that's all the notes that you need. And then you can switch system, of course. But like with a painting, it's like you have a note between C and D and a note between those two notes and another one and another one. And you can always like infinitely get into the nuance and technically what I do on my palette is like that. I start with a couple of notes, but then I have an infinite number of nuances in value between the two. Like for example, between those two, I can have an infinite number of nuances by just mixing those two. And then I can also have an infinite number of nuances by adding something else like adding blue adding alizarin, adding yellow. And then I can also have another number of nuances by just taking the same color and just making it less chromatic or more chromatic. And yeah, it's infinite. That's the, that's the crazy thing is that our instrument has an infinite range of tonalities. But the only problem is like we don't, um, it takes much more, more time to play. The, the good thing about having a set number of tones is that you can just, you still have an infinite number of combinations of, an almost infinite number of combinations of musical melodies basically. But you can at least, you can play fast because you, you don't have to reinvent all the notes on your instrument every time you pick it up. 
but a, a painter does just that. It's like picking an instrument and having to reinvent all the notes every time. Unless you are using colors like straight out of the tube and not mixing them, which is something that some painters have done. Like you just take this pure red, just bam, paint it like that. But it doesn't work for figurative art like we do at least. So, yeah. But just the number of nuances that you can mix is, is crazy. <laughs> Gesundheit. Did I, did I sneeze? Sorry. Didn't even realize that. I coughed, I guess. You're right about the different lights. Yeah. Uh, this is one of my fields of, of, I don't know if you can call it research. One of my field of exploration, we'll say exploration, artistic exploration at the moment, like in my paintings. It's mostly like colored lights, like colored cutters from the human, like the modern era, basically, in humans with skin tones kind of tainted by those lights. It's kind of how the world affects you in a way. What do you mean, Felicia? You mean how you, you don't manage to paint because there is so much variety? This variety is not like, it's not an obstacle though to success in painting. It's like, just embrace it and understand that. For example, when it comes to color mixing, my philosophy is very, is very simple, is don't, overthink the mixing process don't try to nail the right cutter every time it's like for example i don't know if this cutter is exactly the cutter that i need on my painting i'm not sure and when i mix it i'm not even thinking about that i'm just making a cutter that's close enough you know good enough for what i need good enough to start and then from there, you just navigate the color space and you take things like in a dynamic process and just, just analyze and try to see if it needs, if it needs more orange, if it needs more orange, just add orange. Like right here, for example, needs more orange. So I'm adding more orange. If it needs more yellow, add more yellow. And s but don't try to get the exact precise color every time during the mixing. Give yourself some room to, to work around the paint and, just, and never hesitate to first apply it and see how it works. That's one thing. So this infinite variety in nuances is actually a blessing because you start with something completely random and gradually little by little with just little brush marks like that you make it closer and closer to the target and eventually you get there and I find this um, fascinating. <laughs> Too many decisions. Yeah, that's that's true. It's kind of overwhelming in a way, but you know. I have learned how to, I used to be like that, kind of overwhelmed as well. 
I've learned how to relax and to just like for example I don't know if this brush stroke is gonna work but I'm gonna put it apply it anyway and see if see for myself like here doesn't work it's not light enough so just just touch more and and yeah little by little but yeah it, indeed it takes a lot of yeah patience and it's, it's definitely not for anybody everybody like a lot of people just can't even stand the the frustration the patience that it requires but when you learn this kind of patience it's uh, you don't feel overwhelmed anymore you you start having other problems like you go very slowly but you enjoy the process nonetheless i think that's the key i know that deep inside you still enjoy the process it's just that yeah sometimes you realize how how silly of us it can be to just spend hours doing something and end up not being satisfied that's just the <laughs> it's just the reality of making art <laughs> on est en phase Jasmine, on est en phase Basically, as an artist, we in some unconscious way choose back or Beethoven or rap. <laughs> what do you mean? Hello, Deepika Arya. Thanks for thanks for dropping by. If you paint in between the notes, things easily go flat and sharp. Uh, what do you mean? Waverly What do you mean? Well, are you talking music or painting? Because if you paint in between the notes like if you consider that those are notes and I paint between the notes It's going to make my painting more smooth and more blended But not more sharp and I don't know what you mean by flat because for a painting it can mean like there is another meaning for f a flat painting how often do you completely clean your brush while painting not very often um, Niels generally just um, when it's like for for a project like this really almost never because the quantity that I have every time on my brush is is not enough so that i i need to to completely clean up so just dragging it on the paper towel here is enough to remove just the the extra amount that's preventing me from having something clean what i will do is make a complete cleanup with my my jar here when let's say I'm doing something with a paint that has had some white and then I need to paint something black well in that case I'm going to just clean up because the otherwise the white is going to pollute the new color because it's like there's too much of a gap between the two Or when I do, let's say I do a, a background and I have a brush that's really full, but really like completely filled with color all the way until the, up to the ferrule like this, the ferrule, sorry. And then in that case, yeah, I'm probably going to watch, uh, wash the brush a couple of times 
depending. Hi, first time caller, long time listener. Welcome to the stream. Thanks for tuning in. For my taste, no nuance is sufficient in itself when you buy it ready-made. Yeah, agreed. Like, well, technically, figurative painting as, as I do, as, I, as we do, probably, because I'm going to assume that you do the same type of painting, it's like impossible with just paint. Like, you know, pre-made, they make those pre-made tubes, you know, like um, skin tones, tube and they're usually very bad very bad okay completely unrelated note on my painting but i've realized that this side here is too big so i need to reframe It's just a quick correction, but I'm not going to completely correct. It's just a note because I've just realized that this part is just too, too big. And actually this part as well. So I'm sort of Oh, thank you, Sky. You're too nice. I'm just sticking to the master himself, so I have no... no real honor to receive here, but... I'm not getting the the right expression yet, so I don't know exactly something is not I guess I sh you can't really see the model, but I'm not there yet. In terms of uh, getting the, the the right the right emotion. It's not soft not enough yet. So it's another thing that uh -huh. my anxiety would be kicking in with these changes. Nah. I'm way past this stage. But I've been there. I've been there. No, it's um Well, first of all, this is not the worst type of change that I've done. Actually, I think my next, uh, I've done a couple of shorts from my previous work and uh, my next one will, will show um, um, the transformation like where you see the, in one of my main paintings, you see the, the original how it was before and then how I transformed it. Actually, let me try to see if I can show it on stream. Um, I wanted to show how much sometimes, how much you have to change sometimes. I'm gonna try to, to, um, 
to find this. Uh, it's in my shorts. Where is it? So. No, it's not in this file. Um, oh yeah, this one. So this is one uh, that I've made for... Okay, let me... So it started like this. I'm gonna try to... Uh, sorry. It's not the, the right format, but I'm just going to... This is um, from uh, from my previous painting, uh, not my pr my current painting actually. So let me try to go back. So see uh, see how it started, basically a completely different face, and then boom, scratch everything out. Didn't work. This is the type of change that this is. This one is pretty complicated because. Like this is the stage where you see nothing and this is really, yeah, this is really anxiety inducing, but you slowly build up and then this is where I picked up in, in a stream. I think I had this during a stream. I had, I had the painting at this stage. So how different it is from what it started with like this. Look at this, the difference between this goofy face and the final result basically and yeah <laughs> that's uh it's crazy right yeah so yeah just an example of how yeah it's part of the game but i mean congrats to everyone who can paint straight like and get immediate results I sure I sure can't and it's not rare that I have to paint a face twice at least twice before I have something like just decent so yeah That's that's just part of the game. It's really it's, uh, once you learn how to just enjoy it, it's like ah oh, yeah the best part is starting the face all over again. I've been waiting in, I've been waiting for this phase. Just the, the first time I painted this entire portrait, it was just yeah, you know, not the real deal, but the, when you start over now nah, that's the, the right one and sometimes it is because you don't know what you want be before you you see it with your own eyes and the only way to see it with your own eyes is to make it happen on the canvas so yeah but technically i'm not the, the best example because whoever is going to like be crazy enough to x-ray my paintings in the future will have tons of surprises because nothing is like what it seems underneath like there is complete changes all over the place One of the issues of watching other artists is that it often gives a false impression of perfection. It's very encouraging to see you actually paint, not with the intention of making a perfect video. 
Yeah, exactly. Perfectionism is is a game of patience, though. It's like I do have the intention of making it perfect. It's just <laughs> it's just hard. <laughs> you trust me. If I could make everything perfect and like have an actual like an the actual perfection as a result, I would do that every day. I would sign every day to make the perfect painting immediately. Just just let me know where we sign and I'll I'll be there. But it's just so hard. And this difficulty of getting there is what yeah a lot a lot of the time we hide it just I, i'm i'm hiding like also like 75 percent of my failures even though my channel is mostly dedicated on showing them and showing how you can learn from them but like it's just there are just too many i'm still showing a, a whole I, I, a good amount of failures and pentimenti I don't blame artists who don't show them. Technically, first of all, they don't necessarily record everything. And sometimes, you know, the, the trickiest pentimenti that I have, I don't often show them because like, you're really in a point where you can't focus on anything else. Like, so just taking a picture or taking a video of you doing it all over again, is like too much of a strain on your concentration. You have to be in the moment, right? For me, I do it because I do have like the complete setup and all. So basically, almost everything I paint is recorded. I, I generally skip the boring parts, but almost everything I do is technically um, recorded so I can show my mistakes I used to be afraid of showing them but then I've I've realized that it will help more people if I showed them actually because um, if I really want to practice what I preach I I should not um, shy away from from that because I do learn from the mistakes and I have to make them. It's not like I can't have God vision and see through the the whiteness of the canvas, see the perfect the perfect piece of art that's final. Unfortunately, doesn't work like that. But I know that some artists have a much more direct grasp to whatever they want to create. So that some artists are really amazing with that. They have a sense, like a vision of their their final piece, and they can almost immediately get there. I admire that. <laughs> That's nice, Jasmine. Florian is mastering his art because he knows how to turn the mistakes into an advantage. Well, I don't know if I know, but I try. <laughs> I try to do that, yeah. Uh, so what happens to your failures? Mine go in the trash. Um, well, uh, the some of them indeed go in the trash well i never really trash them i just on uh, how do you say unroll and like i remove the canvas from the, the the stretcher bars and i roll it and put it in just a corner of my studio like in the, the in the oblivion area of my studio but other than that, my mistakes, they end up just underneath the rest. It's like, 
the mistakes are the skeleton for the successes. Basically, if you fail this portrait at first, you just... So you have two options. You keep it like this or you let it dry. So you keep it like this, you let it dry and paint wet on dry. Or what you can do is also you, you scratch it off and start over from basically from scratch. So a lot of my mistakes, they actually stay. They're just not visible. And that's the beauty of oil painting is like, it allows you to do that. Not, not all the mediums are so forgiving, which is why sometimes like people want to um, start something other than oil paints, thinking that it will be easier, like painting with, let's say, a, a water-based medium, they think, well, obviously it's going to be easier. Yeah, but oil painting is artistically more forgiving. Like, obviously it's a pain because you have to clean your brushes with, not, you can't clean your brushes with water, but other than that, oil painting is more forgiving in terms of figurative art. Just straight up. Because the, the layering is more simple and yeah, it's just more forgiving. If I had to use acrylic, I couldn't paint the same way. I couldn't have the same approach and I couldn't have the same philosophy that I have with mistakes because correcting the mistakes would be something completely different. Completely different mindset. Uh, thank you for being so transparent, says Ellie. You're welcome. I, I do my best to share what I have to share. <laughs> oh, thank you, Sky. One of my favorite things to do is make art while watching, listening to your live streams. Please keep making them. We'll do. This is this is nice to have a, a, a nice warm message like that. No, everybody is like so so nice, but yeah, it's like a good, you know, good encouragement. So thank you. Yeah, sometimes it's nice to be reminded that people appreciate I and yeah I'm uh, I'm glad it's pretty fun and, and cool to do this knowing that you guys are probably like, doing your stuff like living your life making your art or I don't know what you do but I know that a lot of people um, generally try to use this time I don't know depending on the time obviously but um, use this time to work on their own art. Sometimes it's just a motivation. And like, if you need this type of motivation, just feel, please do feel motivated to and encouraged to pick up a brush and, and paint with us. Just how many of us are, are actually doing something artistic right now? Like right now. I love using water soluble oil paints. Are they inferior to oil paints? Is it bad to practice with them? Uh, no, they are not inferior. The, they have like a couple of, obviously you can't have it all. So they do have a couple of problems, uh, especially due to the water. Like the water doesn't react exactly the same way. It's not the same type of solvent. So it's not going to be exactly the same. And for a lot of painters as well, it's just, it's just so new that a lot of painters don't 
don't know how it's going to behave over the long run you know a lot of painters don't necessarily know if it's going to remain the same 500 years from now so they don't necessarily want to give them a try basically because they are not confident enough but you know other than that i i do think that they're great and they are constantly improving and i've been surprised by the quality the handling and all uh, i haven't used them in any of my main work at the moment i've just used them for you know studies and just to just to um, understand how they feel how they behave and all and i've been pleasantly surprised as long as you don't paint straight up with water it's just use the water to clean the brushes and if you need to thin your water mixable paint down use the water mixable thinner and not the water the water keep it for cleaning because the water has a, a sort of um doesn't have the right type of consistency that's going to allow you to paint in my opinion and it turns the it turns the paint milkish you know gives this milkish discoloration kind of disgusting mm. white i don't know how we call it a ghastly effect so yeah not good mm. but other than that it's uh it's a great medium You helped me a lot with your videos on painting. I would really like to see a video someday about painting clothes in oil like the masters did. Yeah, dra drapery uh, video, definitely. Yeah, I'll keep this idea in mind, Monique. Thanks for uh, the suggestion. Uh, oh, Felicia White is painting. Appreciate the company and the insights. Well, enjoy the painting. Pour le moment, je peins à la gouache en attendant mieux. Le repentir, le repentir est très possible, mais ça dépend du papier. Yeah, gouache is really a thing of its own. So Jasmine is saying that she's painting with gouache. Uh, Pentimentis are possible, but it depends on the paper. It's possible, but it's yeah, it's always a bit tricky though. So making mistakes and correcting with gouache, but gouache is a it's a good medium. I I I don't use it, but it's a good medium. Never seen this type of content here before. Okay, noted, Monique. Struggling at the moment to keep my background in the background. Okay, <laughs> Jody, I'm speechless. Why are you speechless, Jody? Your brush looks like a watercolor brush. Um, yeah, my brushes are mostly... I'm gonna try to... Uh, okay, maybe like this. So this is the only sort of... Yeah, most of the cutters, the brushes that I use are what a watercolorist would use or what a an acrylic artist would use. These are sables, which generally are more used by... This is the only sable that I have and I'm not buying them anymore. I'm only using synthetic anymore. But I will all only have long handles, which is kind of typical of oil painting because oil painting often requires a, a standing up position. I'm just... Sorry. And these are all synthetic, synthetic brushes, round synthetic. It's generally it's my pref preferred like thing right now. Like you know these, and this one is plain, but I, I keep it for blending. 
It's a, a trick that I recommend is always keep your splained brushes because they are very good. Like if you look at this, it's completely splained. Splained, I don't know how you say that. And it used to be, it used to be something like this. So always um, keep your brushes just because they, see, This is the same brush. This one is this one was a bit bigger at first, but this is the same model. So obviously this one is past its prime, but still very useful as a blending brush. And this is what I use only um, synthetic, mostly synthetic rounds and a couple of hog bristles here and there. But even that, I'm switching to synthetic only because I, I, I think it's cruelty free. I, I prefer it. And I'm less worried about the price. I can have some cheap brushes for a very good price and I can very, pretty much use as many as I want. I, like the price is not a problem with synthetic, so it's a, a better option for me overall. I don't know, but but I, I'm mostly using brushes that you could see in um, in the studio of an acrylic artist. Synthetic mostly. Okay, Francine, thank you. Loving this uh, question. When you mix your color steps, you seem to wipe off a lot off of your mix on two paper towels. Will you please share about that? So when I do this, uh, when I mix like that, basically when I get my mix here, let's say I want the, this orange, then what happens at the end of the mix is that I have some of the cutter left on my palette, my palette knife here. So what I would do is just wipe off the palette knife so that my palette knife is clean and then I can start the other color that I need. So I want to do some kind of blue, then I'm going to mix this and then my palette knife is going to be all, all blue. So I need to wipe this down, wipe this off. So that's what I do. And this is why I do some of so much of this, you know, compulsive uh, wiping basically. <laughs> Splayed, yeah, splayed. That's what I was. Uh, thank you, Shadow Star. Gouache is great for studies and also to mix colors. I like the consistency of gouache creamy. Yeah, I also do like it. I actually I prefer gouache to watercolor. Or and if somebody gives me, a, um, you know, a set of watercolor, which actually I don't. I have an old one, but it's like almost useless at this point. Um, when I use watercolor, I'm mostly trying to paint like gouache anyway, so I always end up using um, using watercolor in an opaque way, almost. And I'm always also when whenever I have watercolor, I'm always looking for my gouache white. My my biggest problem with watercolor is that you don't have any white. The only problem is that white is tricky to use with gouache. I mean, you need to have some really high quality white to um, avoid like the props or maybe it's the paper. I don't know. I'm not an expert, but like you know, it's it's like just using white is freaking tricky.
Oh yeah, Henry, you have a lot of a softer touch than what you have with hog bristle. For like, look at the size, look compared to my fingers, look at the size of this painting. It's really something that like no hog bristle can go in fine details like this. It's either a natural, basically, natural uh, sable, very fine point sable, like this one, this one is natural, or <coughs> basically a, a, a synthetic imitation like this one that has a nice soft delicate touch, but no hard bristle can go into this without like creating a mess. Like the hog bristle is more something that for a painting this size, like this size, I would only use the hog bristle for the background maybe or for elements that are not super soft and, and delicate. It just appeared you were discarding a fair amount of the mixed cutters. I understand the knife. Um, yeah, it's probable that it's probable that I was also discarding some of the cutters. Like you know, sometimes you mix and you end up with something that doesn't work. Like it's not the right thing. Well, there is a way to correct this, but it's yeah, you know, you always end up wasting um, a small amount of paint all the time it's like hard to avoid sometimes you you get lucky but sometimes you just end up with a a sort of a blob of paint that doesn't match any of the colors that you want and yeah you can discard some of it i try to <coughs> usually if i have a failed mixture let's say i'm mixing something mixing 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 and then I end up with something that's bad, but not too bad. What I would do is just take just half of it, discard the first half, and then just correct with this. This way I don't have too much new colors to add to make a corrected mix. Otherwise it's like double the amount to make the correction, basically. So. Yeah, it's like you save half of it instead of discarding everything. Are you painting this from a photograph? Yeah, it's a, it's a reproduction, a detail of a reproduction of uh, after Vermeer. So it's a reproduction copy, basically. A printed reproduction. Wow, big question. What brand of paint do you prefer? First, I want to ask the question to everyone in chat as well. Um, I'm, I'm not sponsored by anyone, so don't feel that you have to buy the same brands. I do actually work with um, a lot of different brands because they each have like their own versions of the cutters like a, a yellow ochre will not exactly be the same if you get it from Winston Newton or from Gamblin or from Michael Harding but yeah definitely I have a, a wide mix of brands and sometimes I don't hesitate to actually get like 
several of this, like I, I have my uh, burnt sienna for example, I have one of three brands of the same, like you, you'd think it's the same but it's actually not necessarily always the same, some are more transparent, some will dry slightly faster and depending on what I need I'm gonna switch brands. But some generally good brands are um, from those that I like and use often. You have Windsor & Newton, you have um, Michael Harding, great, great paint, uh, Sennelier I like, uh, Rembrandt I like, um, Le Franc Bourgeois as well. Most of the paint is stuff that I can get easily here. Um, Gambling are also good. Uh, ultimately it's not just the, the brand, that, like the brand is not going to they don't ship you a good painting, they just ship you the brush, the, the, paint, the paints to make it. So it's up to you to make the good painting. I, you, you can give me some, some pretty bad paints and I'll still try to do something good with it. It's just that it's good to have reliable paints though. But it doesn't do anything. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't do the job for you. That's what I mean. Still have to paint. The the paint doesn't magically make the good painting for you. But it doesn't help to have crappy crappy paint though <laughs> I have to say <laughs> after I heard you say that you hated Renoir I checked some I checked some of his paintings and I quite like his style how can you not like Le Pont Neuf well I don't hate everything I hate most of what he's famous for actually and but you know I don't I don't blame anybody for liking him it's just I don't personally feel a vibe Now, would you consider yourself an introvert or extrovert? Uh, more an introvert. <clears throat> but I'm good enough of an introvert that I can always become extroverted if, if needed, like depending on the situation. It's not like I'm not a chronically introvert. In like I'm like I it's not like I can't do anything about it I can be more extroverted if if the situation requires Overall, like you know, painting every day, mostly alone. You have to learn, you have to first be an introvert and learn how to live as an introvert to be a, an artist because you're mostly doing stuff on your own. You don't have to, there are other ways to make art though. 
like go in a sort of a shared studio that's one thing for extroverts so extroverts can still be painters that's what i mean Felicia, paint varies so much unlike music where middle C is a very specific vibration and cannot vary. Yeah, that's right. Well, the only thing approaching that would be like pure black or pure white. That's the sort of the kind of a reference point, but all the rest is completely completely un, um, impossible to grasp basically I love it, it can be. Extroverts can be painters, they just won't shut up. <laughs> Actually, the thing is, extroverts have a better chance of success in the art world even though they might not have as much time as an introvert to make all their paintings alone in their studio but they sell it much better when the time comes and when they have you know to make a, a presentation at a gallery or in a show they can sell themselves it's more natural for an extroverted person to just um, convince people that their art is is worth buying so maybe the introverts they make more paintings better paintings because it's they have more time to focus focus alone in their studios but the extroverts they can talk a lot of crap and they can they can go and, and they can go outside and and take the place of the introverts and selling their I don't know banana taped to a wall or whatever. <laughs> so yeah that's the curse. But being being an extrovert is kind of a necessary skill for painters yeah i absolutely love to be lonely this person he perhaps helps to be a painter well it helps to um like creatively it helps to deal with the toll of you know all the time they needs to make a painting not everybody is capable of sustaining this intensive amount of alone time so it helps to be kind of a loner definitely it helps produ producing the art. <laughs> extroverts are full of hot hair. Hot air. Not necessarily, it's just that extroverts don't mind talking to strangers and 
meeting new people. They don't like stay, you know, shy in a corner if they're at a social event. And it helps, it helps a lot. Like, especially if you're the artist, if it's your show and all, you don't necessarily want to be shy. It's your, your time to shine. So you have to learn how to be kind of an extrovert at some point. I know most of you are probably introverts. I know. Like, like statistically, there's a big chance that most of you, you, you like your alone time. Because if you don't, it's like hard to become an artist and start like spending time doing repetitive stuff alone for hours. It's just that it doesn't have to be a curse, that's all. <laughs> so who is a crusty old hermit? <laughs> Permit. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So we're saying names, right? Crusty old hermit. <laughs> oh my god. Extroverts make me nervous. Yeah, well, the, the only thing is to know if it's, um, if you're an introvert, the best way to know if you're an introvert or an extrovert is when you come back from a party with a lot of people that you don't know, do you feel tired or rejuvenated? Re rejuvenated sorry do you feel tired or rejuvenated coming back from a party with a lot of like meeting people meeting a lot of new people how do you feel do you feel oh i'm so pumped i i can't wait to go next week or do you say oh my god i need to go to bed or i need to go back to my studio <laughs> if if you Resp responded B then you are an introvert sorry to say <laughs> I hate parties and avoid them if possible <laughs> it's a reason that I don't like to paint outdoors also a reason yeah because well, if you paint outdoors, like a lot of people are going to drop by and say, Hey, oh, that's nice. No, you have to, you have to appreciate talking to strangers about whatever you're making <laughs> or go deep, deep, deep in the wilderness when there is nobody, uh, nobody just hiking or
Thank you, Heidi. Speaking of introverts having an easier time at their shows, your show went over it quite well. You had some quite lovely pieces. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the symbolism hin hidden in the astral pieces. How do you feel it went? It went really well. I was really happy to, you know, my introverted self could uh, confront itself with how people experience the, the paintings in, in ways that you didn't necessarily expect but that are also very valid in a way. It's like, it's not like my paintings have like a sort of a, a meaning, like a specific meaning that you have to decode or anything. It's not, not like an enigma in this sense. Everyone, everyone's interpretation can have its own like, like valid validity basically. And I was surprised to see how some people react, some reactions I kind of expected, some reactions really surprised me, but it was really fun to be confronted in how people see it. And actually, what you realize is that when you leave a door open for the imagination of the viewers to sort of wander, you realize that people don't see your story, they see their story through your image, basically. You give them an image and they this is their personality reconstructing the entire thing. And and it's funny, like like the the, the optimistic people say something, the more pessimistic ones will say the opposite. And, and it's a sign that I was uh, successful in my, in my attempts to paint something that, that triggers the imagination and the emotions of my viewers is that I, I want to, um, I wanted to trigger exactly this type of, of uh, feeling. And now the only problem is that I, I'm afraid that I'm not going to do um, as well with my next show because I don't know. Now I'm more thinking it, thinking about my paintings like you know rationally in a way, kind of analyzing. Okay, so this one was had a great reception, and this one had a great reception, but. It, didn't sell so um, okay next time I should do a new painting that's more like this one but less like this one and you start you start more analyzing like this and you start over rationalizing the the rest and and Maybe rationally speaking, it's great. Maybe commercially speaking, it's better. Like you want to focus, like it's normal. Like you want to focus more on what sold <laughs> and just a bit less on what didn't sell. But it's also creatively, it's it's not not great. And I shouldn't see that. So I'm, I'm allowing myself to do both. I'm trying to do some paintings that are more, you know, commercially, that I know will be more commercially successful, and some paintings that are just for the fun of art, you know, just for, because I, I'm i gonna die if I don't make actual artistic paintings that are artistic, but you know, the type of thing that you are never going to sell, you know? because it's like, it's just too intense, too too deep, too profound, too big, too expensive, too whatever. But I'm still making them. My gallery would probably not want me to make as many of them, but I don't know, I'm trying to have a, a, a balance. It's always tricky 
to find the right, the, the middle ground. Because ultimately I, I still need to sell those and I still need to make what works, but I also need to make actual art, that's one thing. Well, it depends on, like, you have to be very confident in your works. Um, Jasmine for the Vernissage Gallery Opening in English, it's Gallery Opening. Um, but yeah, if you're like, it's just all about your work and if you find somebody who free, who appreciates your work to show it, um, like most of the people are really, really nice about the art and even if they don't like it, it's like, okay, so like, you, you don't have to, you can't force anybody to like like we all have different tastes like for example I don't like Renoir but a lot of people absolutely love Renoir so this is like okay it's like there's no fear there it's just like personal taste and I would say you have some kind of stage fright like like a musician or like an actor, but then when you're there, it's fine. People are there to appreciate your work and it's a very, it's generally a great moment. I guess if painting is a visual language, is so, if something didn't sell or your audience didn't understand, then maybe it's like a phase, maybe you just need to say it in a different way. The thing is, the, the paintings that work the best, like in terms of impressions, um, they didn't all, they, they didn't sell. But, I know from talking to people that they were their favorite pieces. But you know, sometimes it's just like the painting is just too too much, like too too big, too something. But like it's like they they would see it in a museum, but not necessarily in their living room. They are glad that the painting exists. They just are not financially interested in getting it and I understand like it's <laughs> I understand I 
it's, that's just just life. So you have to understand the balance between what people told you and how to stay true to your art, how to. It's really it's nice. It's a, a balance to find between the different goals of because you want to still you want to keep producing those impressions like those strong impressions so you need to make strong paintings the strong paintings are not those who sell the best but they are definitely those who stop people in their tracks while they're walking down the street and sort of force people or invite people to come in the in the gallery basically Yeah, yeah, it's all about the balance, so thanks. Ah, il faut pas avoir peur, Jasmine. Ça s'apprend, ça s'apprend petit à petit. Puis après, c'est faut confronter son art petit à petit euh, au monde extérieur. Ça se fait naturellement. Okay, we have 93 likes, chat. We need to get to 100 at least. I'm pretty sure that you, you really liked. It helps, believe it or not, it helps. I don't know how, I don't know why, but just YouTube sort of realizes that this stream is worth suggesting to more people if it has more likes I quickly feel irritated with the speeches around the painting. Yeah, it's normal. It's normal. You have to. I don't know how how advanced you are in your artistic journey, but it it has to start. It has to go little by little in small steps. So first, just share more on Instagram or. then ask your friends and family to just be honest with you and not just tell you what they think and and after the, also what, one thing you can do if you're afraid of people critiquing your art is not ask them do you like it or not is more ask them what does it make you feel and don't don't judge what it makes them feel because what it makes them feel is is something completely different of whether they like it or not you want to be loved you want to be liked we all want to be loved we all want to be appreciated for what we do we want recognition we want love we crave for that and People don't have to love your painting to say what they feel about it. 
And it's possible that they won't love the painting, but it will make them feel something strong and and important. Like they might hate the painting because it makes them live an emotion that they've had when they were younger and they they didn't want to to think about this, but it touches something buried deep in them and all of a sudden they sort of um, they, they, they regain sort of um, they, they, they find this new they, they go back in this memory that they had and they still might hate the painting because it makes them experience that but still it's um, still a very strong painting for for this very reason. If you can manage that that effect, you know. Uh, Maurice, it's not a la prima, but it depends if the if the master was painting a la prima. But if you go back to what I had in the description, I point my philosophy on master copy. Master copy is more for inspiration and fun. It's more for me rather than for technical accuracy towards the the original master. But this wasn't done a la prima, though. No. Yeah, a lot of people are, they, they genu genuinely love the paintings and they love seeing them in real life. And uh, I guess the more our culture turns digital, the more we are bombarded with fast moving images all the time, and the more people will find a, a deeper understanding for traditional art like this that's the opposite of that Yeah, exactly. To feel is better than saying binary I like or I don't. Yeah, the fear of the reaction is that they are going to say I don't like, but what you're interested in is more what do they feel when looking at it is the most important thing because you're, the entire artistic process is all about triggering this feeling. And maybe they will feel something that you didn't expect. Good. It's like you will learn something new about the painting. So that's a great experience. Thank you very much for this demo. First time using oils water based. I wish I tried sooner, but I was kind of afraid. Since it's water-based, can I discard the used water in the sink? Uh, no, no, I don't, I don't recommend that <coughs> because <coughs> uh, the used water, if it, if it turns up like this, it's going to be like right here. It's not water, but at the bottom I have like a lot of, like, you know, a lot of dirty dirty pigments and you know some of these pigments can be heavy metals and stuff so it's it's not it's not good like cadmium and all it's not good to have this down the sink so what i recommend is to let it um let it sink in due to 
like the gravity and then scoop it out with um, with a, a just a, a spoon something like that just take it to a waste disposal facility or throw it in the trash but <coughs> not not down the drain in the watershed it's kind of um, like it can can be harmful so I, I don't technically recommend that La question de Rolien me fait remarquer que ça a plus d'être une... Ah oui, complètement, Jasmine. Ah, Aurélia, depuis euh, C'est pas prévu dans un futur proche, non. Pour le moment. Parce qu'en fait, la version française était, 
était mieux, mais il manque juste la troisième partie et que j'ai pas, j'ai pas traduit. Donc euh, non, la version française était déjà une version améliorée de la première version, donc en fait, euh, pour le moment, elle n'a pas d'update prévu. Euh... En fait, j'ai pas assez de demandes pour que ça vaille le coup. Après, il n'y a pas de problème, on peut parler français aussi pour ceux qui veulent. Vous m'écrivez en français, je réponds en français. Hey Meredith, thanks for dropping by. Unfortunately, it's going to be the end of the stream, so you arrived uh, in the end. How, what time is it in Australia? Sorry, you, you missed most of it, but you can always rewind, so it's a, it's a good thing. All right, yeah, as I said, so I think I'm going to leave it on this note. Um, and yeah. I'm not gonna bother doing the rest, it's just good as it is. I've got um, I've got what I need for for this episode, so we'll see what uh, artists we do next uh, on Monday. I see I think actually next stream is going to be is going to be on um, uh, Monday, not Tuesday, but I'll 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 see. I'll talk, tell you about that when the time comes. So uh, yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for being here all this time, and thank you for the nice comments and all. I'll see you for the next uh, stream. Take care, have fun painting, and uh, bye bye. <laughs>